Innovation. It's more than a goal or a destination. It's a continuous journey. And journeys are full of challenges, surprises, unexpected twists and turns, but also exciting discoveries, big ideas, new ways to make a positive impact on people's lives. Where will your innovation journey take you? Explio is your trusted partner to guide you through all of it. With the right mix of bold thinking and reliable execution, we help you fast track innovation at every step of your value chain, backed by our wide range of solutions. Take advantage of our deep sector knowledge. Our extensive global footprint with unique best shoring capabilities. And our more than 40 year track record in engineering, technology and consulting. We apply our broad expertise across multiple fields, including AI engineering, digitalization, hyper automation, cybersecurity, data science, green innovation, and beyond. At Explio, we can bring your boldest ambitions to life and together act for a better, greener, and more secure society. Let's make your journey a success. Welcome here this evening. I'm Claire McKenna. I'm your host tonight and I'm delighted to be able to greet you in person for tonight's event. I think it's better than Zoom. We can all agree to meet face to face and in person for Through the Lens tonight, which is, of course, the launch of the Business Transformation Index 2022 report for Explio. I think it's safe to say the past couple of years has meant transformation for all of us on a personal level, a professional level, but businesses have really had to dig deep and adapt to new ways of learning and to harness technologies and ways of working that perhaps were put on the long finger. In a moment, we're going to hear from an incredible panel of speakers who are innovation leaders from Media House Ireland, from Athora Group, UiPath, Explio Group and Explio. We were due to have Tao Baker from Permanent TSB, but unfortunately she has had to cancel due to illness. So the guys are going to talk you through transformation through the lens of topics such as skills shortage, technology adoption, diversity and You'll really get to hear about the digital transformation landscape here in Ireland. But before I hand over to them, I would like to give you some context of the Business Transformation Index report. Every year, if you didn't know, Explio commissions research from some of the top business leaders and IT decision makers across multiple sectors and asks for their opinion on business transformation here in Ireland. And the report looks into the challenges that face C-levels and directors across multiple sectors, as well as what's working. And what's different this year is that the BTI report has gone global due to the phenomenal success here in Ireland over the last couple of years. 111 C-suite decision makers across Ireland were surveyed for the report. And tonight you'll get to hear what they had to say about the transformation trajectory for 2022. And you'll gain some valuable insight into how to successfully transform business here in Ireland. At the end, there's going to be a questions and answers section. We'll need to change up the stage a little bit, so you'll have time to think of a question yourself. I'm going to start with some questions, but if there's anything that comes to you throughout any of the talks, you'll find in your goodie bag there your copy of the BTI report, so you can use that for reference. There's also a pen and pad and a few other goodies, but if you want to write something down, you also have five minutes at the end, so. 
I invite you not to be shy. Something that you might think is specific to your own business that you can put to the panel might end up being extremely helpful to somebody else. So, without further ado, I'm happy to hand you over to our first speaker, who is the Managing Director of Explio Ireland, Phil Codd. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Claire. Um, welcome. Welcome to the Business Transformation Index launch of 2022. It's great to be at a live event with, with real life people, even the robot, um, <laughs> in North Key today. We've run many events here, but it's obviously uh, been, been a, a time of troubles for us all. So to be back here is, is, is wonderful. And I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us this evening. Uh, so, so thank you. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, I was also delighted this morning when I took my suit out of the wardrobe. <laughs> it was still fresh in, it, in its dry cleaning cellophane, um, and it fitted. I, I, well, well, it almost fitted, so thank you. <laughs> so, as Claire said, this is, this is our third BTI report in a row. Um, the first one was incepted here in Ireland in 2019. Actually, it was the brainchild of Siobhan Smith, our marketing manager at the time, who has since left us to take on greater things in, in the global uh, world of, uh, of Explio. But, uh, so that is what kind of got us there. And what it does is it gives us a unique view of the market and where our clients and partners position themselves in the digital economy. Um, but it also allows us, as Explio, to gain insights into ensuring that we've got the right skills, the right knowledge, experience that you need through innovation. So, as Claire said, this time we went global, or at least we went international. Um, we, we brought in the UK, Germany, France, and the US to kind of see how they, you know, how they size up against us here in Ireland. Um, and therefore, you know, with 1,000 plus, 1,100 respondents across uh, these five countries, it gave us much greater insight. Um, and the good news is that Ireland pretty much holds its own, you know, when it comes to, you know, where we are and as we hold it up to the Business Transformation Index light box, um, in most cases at least. Um, and if I look at some of the, the stats, in, with 84% with of Irish organization reporting that they believe that profits will be higher in the next five years than previous, I think that's a really good measure. Now, we've got to tape, ta tape that. Uh, ta with, this was done back in October, November time. So the, the, the events that we're going through uh, with the, uh, the terrible things that are happening in Ukraine um, you know, will probably temper that a little bit more. But the great thing is that, you know, broadly in Ireland, we're, we're very, very ambitious and we're very, uh, we're very buoyed up by what's really taken place. So, can you see that? If I, if I do that, can you see that? Yeah. Um, as this says, 80% of organizations have accelerated their digital plans as a result of the pandemic. Now, that's not really surprising, is it? Um, when you consider that we almost became a cashless society. Now, I've always tried to be um, a cashless individual, as many people that drink with me will attest to. But, um, but according to the uh, Banking and Payments Federation of Ireland, ATM withdrawals went down from 19 billion in 2018 to 12 billion in 2021. So, 7 billion in cash. It's not that the money didn't move around, it moved around in a different way. It moved around digitally. The other thing we've done in the last couple of years is, is we managed to move thousands of workers to remote working um, with massive infrastructural shifts, um, uh, particularly even getting PCs. For us, um, you know, with our Indian colleagues, it was a huge struggle because. Most companies in India, they, they, you know, they work in their offices with um, desktops, not with laptops. And you couldn't really stick it under your arm and hop onto the, uh, onto the bus and take it home with you. Um, so getting you know, PCs was a, was a huge problem. And it, you know, pretty much every company in Ireland managed to move to remote working where possible. Um, we moved to online shopping, uh, which drove huge logistics issues for delivery companies, for on past for DPD and, 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 and uh, obviously for, uh, for Amazon. Um, I, I want to call out the health services because despite security issues that they had, 
obviously with the, uh, with the attack, um, they managed to stand up new systems for vaccination systems um, using Salesforce. So any of you that, that have been in, and I'm pretty sure everyone has been in to get vaccinated, it's Salesforce that they use when they're, when they're typing, uh, typing your name in. Um, and also, uh, you know, they stood up a new appointment system yeah, using uh, an Irish company called SwiftQ for COVID testing appointments. Uh, and I think SwiftQ are probably here with us uh, this evening. GP visits changed. Um, you know, at best, they were a phone call. At, uh, at, at worst, they were a video call. I suppose the video call was a little bit better when you were sort of saying, it's, it's there, and he's trying to look down your throat. Um, but also, you know, we, uh, there was a major shift. Prescriptions became e-prescriptions overnight, and none of us batted an eyelid. So society rapidly consumed and embraced that kind of digital change. Hi. Oh, five minutes. Sorry, yeah. Um, <laughs> But, and for, for the IT professionals in the room, tech, a tech spending spree, which is what we've seen, may still end in tears if we've created huge technical debt. Now, back in 2020, when we looked at our report, about a third of organizations um, said that they lacked buy-in from senior execs for IT spend. Um, so you put your budget together and you gave it... The, you know, the IT director or the CIO took it to, to the board, um, and you know, it, it really was, uh, it was knocked back. In 2021, when we looked at the kind of similar question, 74% of the boards uh, were much more likely to approve new spend on IT and innovation. Um, and as we can see here, a massive 88% of Irish organizations said that their boards are much more likely to approve new spend because of COVID. So perhaps COVID did do something good for us, um, you know, in the end. Now, um, I'm not really going to address skills shortages uh, because other speakers are actually going to touch on it uh, during their presentations. But back in 2020, when we ran the survey, 47% of companies said that they were held back by IT shortages. Now, everybody in the room knows what the current market is like. Um, it is tight. Uh, we're all trying to recruit, we're all trying to take from the same gene pool, we're all trying to come up with innovative ways. And, um, you know, some of these are listed along here, and I know some of the speakers are going to touch on those as well. So, in the BTI report for 2020, 45% of Irish companies told us that they planned to increase their use of machine learning and AI. In 2021, there was a greater shift. 69% of the respondents said that automation would expedite processes and deliver benefits at pace. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to steal your slides. Um, but the really interesting thing, if you look at this, um, you know, I said that we were broadly uh, aligned with, with our European and US counterparts. Um, but in this case, 19% you know, of Irish companies said that they're going to use automation and AI. Um, to address that skill shortage. So, you know, are we out of touch? Have we missed a trick? Or actually, is there something else that we're thinking of doing? So, just to end, I've started to give you some food for thought, hopefully, to generate some questions that you're going to ask us at the end. And I've laid out the path uh, for our speakers to follow. Um, and so, with much more ado, it's over to Claire who will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. I'm delighted to introduce now our next speaker, who is Rebecca Keenan. She is Global Head of Process Automation for XPO Group. Thank you. Thank you. I've been told this clicker is easy, so we'll see. Okay, there we are. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Delighted to be here. Only slightly nervous that none of you are behind a screen anymore, but we will power through. Um, I'm the global head of process automation here in Explayo. Means something different depending on the day of the week, typically. But today, I'm going to be looking at business transformation through the lens of hyper automation, and you know what does that actually mean for us? So, um, I think as a starting point, you know digital transformation, it's where many of these talks do start. Um, it's definitely not a new concept. However, I think it is ever-changing. 
It means different things to different organizations. It can mean different things within organizations sometimes. So when I was looking at the global BTI report and also the Irish one, I wanted to pull out some stats as to, okay, well, why are we still you know, so hung up and digital transformation is probably keeping us a lot, a lot of us in jobs at the moment. So you know, this first stat, so I wanna fall off the stage. 76% <laughs> agree that organizations will not survive without digital transformation. Okay, so that's why we're still talking about it. You know, we actually have to figure out how to do it well because maybe we're all doing bits of it well, but it's not all integrated. Because I live in the world of automation, I then pulled out this next stat, which was 76% of firms do agree that automation and bolder use of automation will be necessary to fill some of those skills shortages. And I think this just doubles down again on the fact that you know, automation is changing how we work. It's changing how our employees work. It's changing how we consume information. So we really need to make a, a cheers. <laughs> we really need to take um, you know a focused approach on what that means. And this next stat, which I would say it's interesting, I guess it's kind of upsetting for folks who deliver these solutions, but sixty-six percent of us are actually experiencing underutilization of our solutions, our digital solutions. So if we're creating all of these new ways of work, but none of us are actually working in new ways, you know, does it make a difference? Um, probably not. So from my perspective and you know, the world that I live in, I really see automation as a driver for digital transformation across all of the industries and clients that we work with. However, I do see people being at the heart of it and being still at the heart of our organizations Hence, they need to be at the heart of our delivery as well. And that's kind of what we're going to talk on in the next couple of minutes, how for all the great technology that we have available to us currently, it's still people you know, driving our organizations. But to kind of bring it back a little, and you know, when I say automation, what am I actually talking about? Um, I just picked out three phrases uh, for the sake of tonight. So we have automation, process automation, hyper automation. They're all kind of the same thing, kind of different. <laughs> it depends who you talk to. But for me, it's really about increased complexity and scope of what we're actually able to do. So, you know, with that simplest and easiest scale of, you know, just automation, it was traditionally task-based, very rules-based, you know, working within one section of a team. We then head towards, you know, process automation. I sometimes interchange that with intelligent automation. We have tools like robotic process automation, chatbots, machine learning. We're essentially able to automate more of a process. We're able to not only automate you know, across a full function in your organization, but cross-functionally as well. And then when we you know, start talking about hyper-automation, sounds very exciting, doesn't it? Um, it's kind of the new word of the moment. Um, this is really the concept that to stay competitive in all of our organizations, we need to automate everything 100%. And anything that we can't automate 100%, we have to introduce a human in the loop solution. So we actually all have to start increasing and you know, accepting this fact that it's digital and human workers that are gonna make up our workforce. Um, for the most part, I think, and apologies if anyone doesn't agree, we're probably in the more of the PA space at the moment, trying to head to that hyper automation. But for me, in reality, that means it's not just about automating your operational processes anymore, it's about making your people more efficient as well. So for example, in Explayo, we have a lot of our BAs who are actually using automation technology to um, help them gather requirements and document them. So again, we can make everything quicker and get to value quicker. Um, so again, you know, it's, it's changing how we actually do things. So then if I look back and, and look at the global report, which you all have copies of, I wanted to see, was I being a little biased in how uh, strongly I feel about automation when it comes to what's actually you know, transforming and why people need transformation. Um, and these are kind of what were pulled out. Now I could stand up here and make an argument that automation helps everything here, but I'll get away from Rebecca. So we'll just focus on the top two for the minute. So what were people, you know, what was the reason for transformation? So delivering the best customer experience. Again, that's so key to so many of us at the moment. And when I look at some of the solutions that we're building, you know, we have hundreds of robots for working for our clients at the moment who, direct, who interact directly with our clients' customers and also working in the front office contact center. So if we think traditionally, you know, when someone called us, we had to validate who they were, 
we had to maybe we had to pull information from you know possibly 10 different systems that were difficult to access and they might not be too happy with us if they're calling us in the first place. But now we have technology, and again, if we're thinking down that line of you know, using different types of technology together, we can use WhatsApp and chatbots to maybe validate who the customer is. We can use RPA to gather all the information. We can then put a note on the account to say what they called about the last time, and then we can give it to the agent all before your customer says hello. So that's a very different experience for not only your customer, but your employee as well. And then in terms of increasing productivity, that's part for parcel in any automation technology that you use. You're going to see increased uh, productivity. And if I look at some of the kind of bigger successes that we have on this island, um, I think our client might be in the room, so you might recognize some of these stories. But we worked for um, one of our clients in their online sales department, and in 2020, we put 50,000 orders through their, uh, their robots, their digital workforce. So that was huge because their customers were ultimately getting their end product a lot quicker, there was less mistakes, and at the same time it was freeing up a lot of time. Because that equated to 10,000 man hours in a year saved for the team. So all of a sudden they could take on a lot more work while keeping headcount consistent. So again, when we start thinking of these new solutions, that's what we're doing. We're changing how we actually function as a team. So I think, I'm, I, I should be able to say then, Pretty much all of us are in agreement that we should be more radical in our approach to automation. We have to make sure that we are actually taking a focused approach on what we're trying to do, and if we're not moving a pace, we're moving too slow. So in terms of actually doing it from a delivery standpoint, we need to make sure we have a vision and a roadmap. Um, when I go into clients a lot and you know, they're struggling with scaling and you know, how do they move from maybe RPA, uh, bringing more intelligence into it, when I ask them, well, why are we doing it? Like, what are we doing it for? Uh, sometimes I don't get an answer. And it sounds quite simple, but it's difficult to get from A to B if we don't know where B is. And then in terms of just day-to-day -day execution, we need to make sure that we're being agile in our teams. And I think this is where I'll kind of change tact a little and talk about the human in the room. Um, because if I look at our most successful deployments to date, it's when we're not just focusing on technology and process, but people as well because for all of the fantastic robots that I've seen over my career, and there's been quite a few, it's been talented people that are creating those solutions. At the same time, we're all trying to increase our, you know, our digital and human workforce coming together. We won't see any success if you know, our humans don't want to interact with their robot colleagues. So again, if we want to get to this large scale, 100% automation, people are still at the heart of what we're doing. And when we looked at the BTI, it's the global report, we put some success factors in there. There was nine of them. And I thought it was really interesting because a lot of them were actually human focused, uh, more so than potentially technology focused. Um, and I just pulled out two. So the first one being an openness to cultural change and adopting a digital first mindset. And um, this seems quite simple when you say it out on a stage like this, but we have to really from bottom up change how we think about creating solutions. How do we now solve problems? Um, you know, we have robots now working where, you know, traditionally you would put human headcount, we've put robot headcount. Think about that online sale, uh, sales team I talked about, increased sales during Black Friday, um, a recruitment team in a theme park, a uh, recruitment team in a theme park for summer months hiring more staff, an insurance company who gets more claims after a storm. We're now not just relying on that human element, but uh, the robot one as well. But we had to create those solutions in a starting point. And then this next one, and it kind of ties back to that 66% stat that I talked about. We need to make sure that we prevent underutilization under of these solutions. Because like I said, what's the point in creating new ways of working if none of us are actually going to work in those new ways? Um, I've had some tricky conversations over the years where I've been an advocate for a robot. Uh, the human team is fighting me, telling me that they weren't the issue, it was the robot. Um, so again, there's lots of these different types of conversations that we need to start having. I also had a conversation before where you know, we successfully deployed a robot. It was saving a team 10 hours a week. A couple of weeks later, I went in and the human team were still doing the process in tandem to the robotic team. So we had essentially doubled up what we were doing. Now again, these new ways of work, it's not always distrust. I know that gets thrown around a lot. You know, sometimes it can just be confusion. We're changing how people are working. We're changing how managers look at teams. Maybe we need to change how we performance review our people. But again, to conclude here, 
this workforce of digital and human and hyper automation or whatever you want to call it, it's very much the workforce of now. So we need to make sure as organizations we're responsibly delivering these solutions. So it's not just your technology stack, which obviously needs to be fit for purpose, secure and agile, but we have to remember that humans, um, for the most part anyway, are still going to stay the heart of our organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much to Rebecca, and it's good to hear that we're not going to be replaced completely anytime soon. That when you're talking about digital transformation, it's talking about improving how we work. And to underpin that even a little more, I'd like to invite our next speaker, who is the sales director of UiPath, Siobhan Ryan. My name is Siobhan Ryan, I'm sales director with UiPath, which is one of the market leaders in intelligent automation. I've been with the company for over three years, but I've actually been in technology since I graduated college, right? It's, I've been in space for since 95, including 10 years with Oracle in California. And I've seen many, many bun fights between IT and the business and, and been involved in many transformation projects. And actually interesting how I got into automation was I met one of, uh, I met somebody that I consider a really good mentor over at dinner, maybe one or two margaritas a couple of years back. And I had been in the big data and analytics space. And I was saying to this mentor, I said, you know, I'm finding it really, it's a struggle, right? I'm working with customers to try and get these big data projects off the ground. And it's so disruptive. It's so hard to politically align things. So many different parts of the ecosystem have to come together. And I said, by the time they've argued for six months over who even owns the customer master, it then takes another year to get it implemented. And uh, my friend was saying to me, you know, Siobhan, you've done like, I don't know, 10 or 15 years doing processes, business processes. And now you've got this experience in machine learning and AI. So why don't you put that together with RPA? Now, literally, I was like, what, RPA, what? So I started to research it. And I just was like, this is amazing. So I called a, a really good female friend of mine who was with UiPath in Sweden, and I said, you have to get me an interview. And uh, she did get me an interview. And uh, so what I'd first of all like to say is here's to really good mentors. Here's to women in tech looking after each other and the best ROI I've ever got from a margarita. <laughs> right. Um, I'm missing a slide, but the lens that I'm going to speak to today is, um, is automation um, and the future of work. So this is just my most boring slide because UiPath has gone um, at IPO, I have to do the safe harbor. But I'm not actually here to talk about UiPath technology, products, platform, but really to respect from a thought leadership perspective is what are we seeing as industry leaders in the market that fuel into said this was easy, um, that uh, really focus on, uh, on the lens of future of work. So, so let me take a step back. According to Gartner, automation is the fastest growing software, enterprise software category. Why? Because it has a relatively low total cost of ownership. It's non-disruptive. It works on the tech stack that you have. And it has a fast ROI, because, fast or relatively, because it's an agile technology. But the other thing that has a huge impact on is employee engagement. And I think it's a metric or a lens that we don't look at often enough. And Forrester added on to this by also saying, of all of the technology tools that we can leverage, automation has the most impact on our culture, which really makes sense, right? Because automation is literally about how we work with our processes on a day-to-day -day basis, how we actually go to work each day. So, UiPath is an industry leader in automation. I'm not going to cover this other than to say that that's really why we were invited today, that in terms of our end-to-end -end platform um, market share, we, we're in that top right corner. But what's more important is our mission. Our mission statement is to accelerate human achievement. What we actually mean by that is just taking all of the mundane things that many of us do in our day-to-day -day job and have robots or digital assistants help with them. Um, it's estimated there's about 60 billion hours that are wasted in, in corporations every year just because of these 
mundane elements and if we can get digital assistance um, that this is um, sorry, um, is going to change this picture um, because we have a long way to go in terms of accelerating human achievement right if you look at an average eight hour day up to four hours of it is spent in non-productive work um, there's an even more sobering statistic that there's about 50 million, by 2020, there's going to be, 2030 I should say, there's going to be 50 million surplus of low-skilled workers in our world, and there's going to be 45 deficit of medium to high-skilled. So we have this huge business imperative that's coming down the path where we have to upskill and reskill our employees, but we also have a moral obligation to really uh, bring people along this journey with us. Um, we're not in the Western world kind of there yet with, the, with, with those kind of tailwinds. But actually in Japan, um, you've probably heard of Kuroshi, where certain, um, it was actually one of a, a young lady threw herself out the window because of all of the, the work, because they don't have the, they have labor shortages. Um, and uh, one woman actually unfortunately threw herself out the window, but that company is Dentsu, which is an advertising agency. And they have now a chief automation officer. They've automated every process that they can to try and bring value back to employees. Um, because the truth is, um, the, the, the issue isn't a lack of investment. You're probably a lot of budget holders here today. There's trillions going into technology investment but the productivity is declining. There's a 35% decline, and why is that? The number one reason that we're finding is fragmentation in our technology stack. The average large organization has 175 applications that, tr that they're trying to make work together. We're trying to keep it governed, secure, resilient, um, and that's a big lift. And it's, but processes don't exist in your SAP or your Oracle. How many processes start in emails, portals, mobile phones? And we have to make these linkages happen. And as IT departments, we can't just, you know, API or customer way out of it. There's this linkage burden that is what it takes to really do the day-to-day -day job. And it's people that are actually doing these linkages. We're the ones cutting and pasting going into portals, moving data around, checking repositories, and that's the swivel chair. That's that four hours that I was talking about earlier that just tends to go into a bit of a dead zone, um, which is why we actually need automation simply to relieve the stress that's created in organizations. And that's a quote from Professor Leslie Wilcox, who is a, he's a global um, leader. He's with the London School of Economics. He talks about workforce globalization um, and I just love the simplicity of that statement, actually. Um, I'm just going to talk about a, an Irish customer that I think brings some of this to life, because what RPA and automation does is it's literally about bringing time back into people's day. So this company is a subsidiary of a US pharma. They're a small subsidiary, keeping in mind that nine out of the 10 top pharma companies are in Ireland, so it's very, very competitive. And they said, how are we going to attack, attract the best and brightest finance team? Um, we need to be able to brand ourselves that if you come and work with us, you'll be insight driven. You will be really, really close to our mission statement, which is to accelerate the time to get drugs to market to save people's lives. And so they said, we're going to automate all of the mundane stuff that we have. And this was their very first bot, which was just simple. It was a reconciliation bot, but it saved them 48 minutes a day. And when you multiply that out, that just that one bot actually had a 500k saving. But the most important thing was the time back. And I say that to us all as business people, that um, you can actually take the saving, depending on your metrics, and put it into your, your, your efficiency. Or you can say, do we take that time saving and put it into value creation and really help our employees to be insight driven and really close to our mission statements? And it has a direct impact on our retention. Um, Rebecca talked about this, RPA is evolving with AI. We're soon going to see a world where we're not falling all over ourselves grappling with what's RPA, what's machine learning, what's AI, what's OCR, what's NLP, 
but that the platforms and the technologies that are successful in the marketplace just take that away. It's about providing the consumable ways um, to have this technology and have digital assistants that have the smarts. Like Rebecca also said, it's human in the loop. So how do we have robots and digital assistants take the mundane stuff and start to advise us on what might be a next best step? Um, my final point is actually one on um, upskilling and reskilling. I mentioned the moral imperative to, um, to really be part of, you know, how are we bringing everyone along with us? What UiPath has done is made all of our academy freely, freely available online. So all of our education is free. We've partnered with universities, including in Ireland, where our technology and curriculum, um, for example, in Galway University, first year students in, in finance are now on BBS, are actually learning automation. Chartered Accountants Association of Ireland are learning automation for that next generation. Um, but a story I really like is um, we've partnered with the School of Automation, which are actually in Glasgow, but they did a program with the Limerick and Clare Education Board where they took, it's a pilot program, but it's actually gone live. They took 12 unemployed people in Limerick and put them through a 12-week course where they learned all about RPA, learned a new skill. Um, and that generation and that cohort are now starting year-long traineeships with companies in Ireland, including some of them who are working with the HSC, which is doing a huge amount of work to try and free up medical staff to deal with, you know, including the COVID crisis, right? We, we've actually been part of a journey with the Matter Hospital where nurses are saved three hours in infectious disease, nurses are saved three hours a day from all of the back office processing that they would have had to do with legacy applications, which you can't just throw out, and very expensive to upgrade. So they're now doing that with, um, with UiPath, and we're very proud to see these kind of programs where we're bringing, uh, we're bringing people along with us to the future of work. So thank you all. Thank you very much to Siobhan and I think it's so interesting at the effect it has on the culture because I mentioned the transformation we've all gone through over the past couple of years and one of that has been the way we view work, people cutting out that commute and getting more time back but sometimes we get stuck in the way things are and an excellent example of that is going to come from our next speaker moving from print first to digital first. I'm delighted to Invite to the stage Henry Minogue, he is CIO of Media House Ireland. Good evening everybody, um, delighted to be here this evening, it's great to see so many industry colleagues in the flesh again as opposed to Zoom screens etc, so really happy to have this opportunity to speak this evening. So my name is uh, Henry Minogue, I'm the CIO in Media House Ireland. So, Media House Ireland would previously be known to yourselves as Independent News and Media PLC. So we were Ireland's largest print and digital media publishers, national weekly titles and regional titles as well. Um, media House, we became Media House in 2019. So we were purchased by Media House, a Belgian publishing company who have operations in Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands, now obviously Republic of Northern Ireland and Germany also. One of the first time I met the people from Media House when they were coming over and inquiring about purchasing INM, and the chairman of the company said, we want to use digital to scale across borders. And these guys were very ambitious in terms of how they wanted to use digital to disrupt and transform a, a very, very traditional print focus focused business. So where was the business at that particular point in time? So we're talking about 2018. It was very much a print business. The paper was the product. You know, when I asked someone, when I joined the organization, I said, talk to me about product development in this organization. Says, the paper is the product. That was the thinking at the time. There was a fear that having a paywall online would hurt the online advertising business that was there. And I, no, we can't have a paywall because that's actually going to hurt. So it was very protectionist, protect the current print product, protect what we're doing on digital at the moment, as opposed to opening it up. A complete lack of digital first thinking resulting in very, very poor online product. So content was not being put online first, it was being put print first. You know, put in the product that people pay money for and then put it online afterwards. It's news, get it out there, get it out there as soon as possible and monetize it. From a technology perspective, 
It was a separate, when I walked in there, it was a separate digital team in one building, a separate IT department in the basement of another building. When I brought them together, it was the first time they'd ever even met each other. There was no platform view, no cohesive data strategy, and a lack of the required resources on digital architecture, business analysts, data scientists, project management, SEO specialists, etc. So we had to move into looking and changing the culture about digital being an opportunity and not being a threat. But it was always looked upon as a threat at that particular point in time. Digital was a threat to the print business. Print is declining 10% year on year. So, you know, and trying to protect that was bringing you nowhere. Digital was looked as a threat to our existing B2B operations. If you put a paywall up, well then there's going to be less eyeballs on the advertisements, therefore our existing B2B revenue is going to start tanking as well. So the thinking was very much protect what we have as opposed to thinking outside the box and looking where we can go. In. So looking at digital as an opportunity, we we're saying, look at the audience you can get from a digital perspective outside of Ireland as well, the diaspora. Look at how you can personalize content in a digital space as well. Look at the opportunities around audio and video where most people are actually consuming their content today on apps and so forth and mobile devices. So started thinking around those areas and saying, okay, we need to move. Digital is a cultural change. The biggest problem inside was technology gets solved. We can all sort technology, but it was about a digital culture and creating a digital culture. The news business is very much focused around trust as well. There's a couple of quotes here from Fiona and Sheehan back in 2018 about you know, how we're 113 year old history as a company, but built on trust and trusted content. But we had to have a conversation with ourselves about if you're going online, you're now in a different place. You know, there's a lot of content online and Fake news, clickbait, people are just trying to grab audiences online. So in a digital world of fake news and clickbait, we needed to be honest, we needed to be trusted, and we need to be customer focused. So we had a couple of key principles that we wanted to work with as we, as we went on the digital journey. From a business transformation perspective, as I mentioned, when I was asked to come and join, what was INM at the time, to be part of this particular journey, I said, you want a CIO to come in and do your digital transformation for you? And it says, no. I said, okay, what are you doing? And they were transforming leadership. So they brought in, there were new owners came after we started the strategy. The new publisher came in with the new owners. But they said, oh, no, Henry, we're bringing in a chief information officer, but we're also bringing in a chief customer officer, and we're bringing in a chief commercial officer. So, okay, now you've got a proper senior team that you can actually work with. Because this is a business transformation program of which technology is just a key pillar and a key work stream. But it has to be business driven and business led. So a vision and strategy. We said we are going to become digital first. And what does that mean? It means print is second. And digital absolutely has to become first. And then bringing in digitally focused leaders all around the business, SEO experts in the newsroom. The only time a technology person was in the newsroom before is that somebody couldn't fix their computer or they locked themselves out of their password. Embed yourself in the news organization and explain the benefits of digital and SEO and audience and so forth to them as well. Data-informed decisioning, something that hadn't been in there before. Real-time metrics, and then acquisition retention skills from a customer's perspective. From a technology perspective, we had to create a new technology and innovation department to bring together all of the technical and digital resources under the one umbrella. Create a platform view and outline a phased roadmap of digital capability delivery. Build out our data capabilities and acquire the skills needed. Architects, analysts, data scientists, engineers, analysts, PMs, etc. Select your delivery partners very carefully. And I will straight up plug to Explio here. Um, I've worked with them for years, and I don't look at them as being a supplier. I look at them as being a trusted delivery partner. I work with them in the QA space and have done so from previous roles and previous organizations. And when it comes to any significant program and the QA side of things, I know that's going to be OK, because I know who's going to do it for me. Move fast and take some risks. Our focus areas, we focus everything around three pillars. So it was about growing and developing our people, a digital culture, and investing in technology. Completely different skill sets, technologies, and processes than that was required to print and distribute a physical newspaper. We essentially had to become a 113-year-old startup. The transformation challenges from it were really, really there's some very difficult things that had to be dealt with. Talent retention and acquisition, always a difficulty. We're this side of the river, we're looking across at all the big labels on the other side of the river in terms of trying to grab talent that you have and you're trying to compete with them to get new talent and so forth. I know Seamus is going to talk around some talent acquisition strategies. Embracing new technologies, 
customer experience and relationship management. When we sold our newspapers, we sold them to shops, and shops sold them to people, so we didn't have a relationship with the readers. In a digital world, that's completely different. They register, they subscribe, you now have data, and you now have a customer relationship that you need to grow, mature, and bring forward. Culture of print first was part of the DNA. As I said, it had to be digital first, and print had to be second. Um, okay, so not going to get into the techie slides, but essentially, had to be fueled by big data, turn viewers into registered customers, have a customer onboarding process, have customer engagement processes, identify customer trends to optimize content across platforms. You could go to targeted advertising based on customer content demand, upsell cross-selling of services, micro-payments micro, micro management, flexible subscription modeling. All of this is alien to the organization because they just generated a newspaper every day. But it's all part of our journey. We developed the roadmap. Essentially, agile delivery, phase delivery over a very piece of time, continual value creation, bringing the business with us on that particular journey. We launched in February 2020 and in terms of our online paywall. So it's the first time we actually had a digital B2C product. Interesting time to launch as well because February 2020 was a general election in the country as well with unclear output. So a lot of people were coming to newspapers for opinion articles and so forth. So we started to put them slightly behind the paywall and started creeping, creeping our, our subscribers that way. We got a pandemic bounce without a doubt because we, we were lucky in the sense that we launched in February and then the pandemic started pretty much in March. Everybody went home. People weren't coming into town. They weren't picking up the newspapers. They weren't going to the shops. They were afraid to touch a newspaper. So it really, really helped us in terms of pushing our digital subscribers at that particular point in time. I remember the day we launched, someone said, Henry, we'll probably get 8,000 subscribers in the first year. Uh, we got 30,000 subscribers in the first year, which was, we were very, very happy with. And second year performance, I'll just put a quote here from our publisher, Peter Vandermersch, who says, 20, he said, today, two years ago, and this is only the 11th of February, we launched a new site, independent.ie, with a selection of articles behind the paywall. Two years later, we've more than 50,000 digital subscribers, and the numbers are climbing because good journalism is worth, is worth paying for. So we have a long way to go on the journey, but I think the key point I just want to say about it is having the right technology in place is crucial. Having the right partners in place is crucial. But the key to success was changing the culture and bringing the required skill sets to be successful and to accelerate your digital journey. Thank you very much. Henry and I think it's a great example of even how a customer base sometimes needs a good pull. We just find it hard to change sometimes and to accept doing things a little bit differently and to talk to us now about changing how we think about people and technology. I'm delighted to invite to the stage Seamus Kennedy, who's CIO of Athora Group. Thank you. Good evening all, and Phil, can I first of all say thanks very much for keeping the bar open, because usually as <laughs> tail in Charlie, I'm standing between people and the drink, which is never a good place to be. And second of all, I think we, we get the slides up, with the green button. Excellent. So I'd also like to thank you for giving us a chance to wear a suit as well. I tried the windswept and interesting look uh, during the, or as my wife said, the feral look, right? <laughs> But it's good now to be kind of going back into suits again if I could only find a tie somewhere, right? <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Um, I want to focus a bit today in talking about our experience in Atora and how we're going through a very large change journey at the moment, but how we've managed the whole challenges around staff shortages and getting the right talent on board to be able to deliver that change journey. So we are, and apologies about the typo, we were founded in 2017, so I was one of the first eight people to join the company. We are a life insurance and a reinsurance uh, group, fully focused on the continental European market with offices here in, in Ireland as well. We have grown mostly by um, acquisition over the last number of years in Belgium, in Germany, in Bermuda and in Tor Ireland, and we have recently are going through the process of acquiring a company in Italy as well. We also have um, recently uh, also acquired a piece of, uh, a very large piece of the uh, Belgian NN life insurance, reinsurance business as well. 
We have 2.3 million customers. So we started with zero customers in 2017. We now have 2.3 million uh, customers. We have assets of 79 billion, and we have 1,800 employees across our, our entire base. And we still are very much aggressively on an acquisition strategy with 4 billion in unconditional committed capital that we have to spend as well. So while that sounds all really good, what we recognized very quickly was that a couple of years into this, we had no, and we needed to have come up with a plan about what our future operating model was. How were we as a company going to integrate all these acquisitions to make the company work? And we launched a program called Becoming a Tora. And Becoming a Tora was effectively about saying, how do we take a Tora from where we are now to where we want to be as an organization? How do we, and we focus on a couple of key pillars. How do we share our services more? How are we actively thinking about what we do? How do we increase our focus on the customer? And also then, how do we have the, because we are a highly regulated entity, how do we have the right focus and emphasis on controls? And how do we consistently drive um, improved cost performance? So what started off two years ago as a concept about thinking about our operate model very quickly morphed into this year, 80 million in spend, 24 plus projects, where we are delivering not only the operate model in terms of process and services, but also delivering a lot of the foundational systems that we need as a company as well to be able to go forward and grow and scale in our, in our operation. Some of those are like we're having to build group financial systems because everybody had their own way of doing it. We have to build investment databases. We have to build, uh, we have to replace uh, one big issue in the life insurance market in Europe is a lot of the policy admin platforms are legacy. They're very much based on on-prem. So we have had to translate those into new platforms, migrate them to new platforms, migrate them into the cloud. We had to build very much a strong internal control framework mindset. So a lot of projects going on and literally in some cases, because you were buying companies where they weren't invested in over the last number of years, we had to provide a lot of basic stuff like security, like data loss prevention as well. So an incredible challenge to try and figure out how do we actually deliver this. So in, in deciding how we move forward, we put together what we called our delivery architecture. And the delivery architecture was very much about, we started with the right mindset. We started saying to ourselves, okay, as a company, all of us have previous experiences in coming, you know, that we bring with us. But in developing the architecture, it has to talk about what are our core and design principles? How do we want to live as an organization? Um, so our values, our culture are very important in terms of how we deliver. Then we decided we needed to have five building blocks. And we said, you know, let's talk about our service architecture. What's our strategy for service? What's our data strategy? What's our technology strategy? What's our controls and governance strategy? And then we said, okay, we know one of the key pillars that's been talked about a lot of speakers here, is we need to think about our people. We need to think about our culture. But when we started thinking about it, we said, well, actually, do we really have a people strategy? So we have the data strategy, we have the security strategy, we have the infrastructure strategy, but are we really thinking about our people? And in not thinking about our people, how are we going to actually succeed in delivery? Because we can automate lots of things, we can deliver lots of solutions, but we're always going to fail if we don't have the right people to help us make this happen. So we very much focused on, let's build a people strategy, and that people strategy will underpin how we deliver all of these and be successful. So moving into 22, and thinking about where we are today, you know, one of the challenges for us is, is COVID forced us all to rethink again how we work as an organization. And in 222, according to Gartner, we're gonna to continue to try and figure this out. We're going to deal with very high attrition rates. We're going to deal with quit rates. We're going to deal with very large challenges of getting those talent on board to be able to do the work. So what I'd like to maybe touch on with, with you tonight is there's three particular things we have focused on as part of developing our, our, our strategy. We focused on creating and executing on a human, human center, flexible work experience. We developed an effective delivery model and we have and then put, wrapped all of this around with a very deliberate focus on communication. So if I'd like to spend the last couple of minutes maybe talking a bit about what those three things actually meant for us. So in terms of, of having a human-centered, flexible work experience, and 
what I, what I really want to mean about this is we were very deliberate in thinking about this. As much time as we spent thinking about what our design principles are in terms of architecture, we said, what are our design principles? How are we going to implement this human-centered, flexible work experience? And the first thing about it was saying, what's your value proposition? You as a leader leading people, you as a manager leading people, why do the people want to stay? What value are you bringing to the people and staying with your organization? What value are you bringing to the table as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a leader that would get somebody to come and work for you? We're very good as a life insurance company telling our policyholders why they should invest with us, but we're not very good at telling our employees why they should invest with us. So that's the thing we focused on. We listened to our employees. We said, what do you want? How do you want to come back to work now in 22? What kind of work environment do you want to work? So based on that feedback, we have moved to a policy where it's completely voluntary to be in the office for the majority of our staff. If you don't have a distinct reason to be there, you can work from home. But we'll still keep our offices open. We'll still give people an opportunity to meet. But we didn't deliberately go down to this two days a week or three days a week. We said, actually, if you don't want to come in, you don't have to come in. That, and that has worked really, really well for us. We were strategic in our thinking. We also focused, and I think it's really important, everybody talks about getting the new talent in. But what are you doing for your existing staff? How are you retaining your existing staff? How are you looking after them? So we were very proactive, and we are very proactive in working with our HR department, developing action-oriented plans for each employee. Um, you know, it's not all about the comp, and thinking about that work-life balance, ensuring everybody has you know, goals and career paths, that, and you spend time with them to do it. But what's also really important is that you train your leaders. So most people will put you know, goals and plans in place, but then they forget to train their leaders and managers to actually execute on it. And one of the big reasons people leave organizations is because we don't invest in our leaders and in our managers. So it's very important you do that. And I think developing, you know, developing that modern operate model, it creates a differentiated employee experience. It it's also a driver of both retention and attraction. And finally, and the last thing I'd say on this slide is, as a leader, your staff can work remotely, but you need to be present. As a leader, it's really important whether you, physically or virtually, you are present in your employees' lives. You're explaining, you're communicating, you're empathizing, you're working with your employees. So that, that is one of the levers that we touched on. The second one is we developed an effective delivery model. So by, defect, by developing, so we said, look, if we're agreeing that it's going to be an environment where you're going to work remotely, then how do we make that delivery model work? So we focused on you know, virtual working, how do we make it work? But what we also focused on was developing strategic partnerships so that, that Henry touched on. So virtual working creates an opportunity for everybody to integrate external vendors into your, high, into your delivery model and create that hybrid delivery model. And what we focused on is moving away from having many vendors to having a few strategic partners who understand our business. And we moved away from maybe that traditional vendor model of the vendor being a, a order taker to actually the vendor understanding your business and helping you develop, understanding your strategy and becoming a real partner. So your team, your hybrid team is no longer your internal staff or a few day rate contractors. Your hybrid team is now your strategic partner in, in partnership with your, your, your internal employees as well. Very hard to get right, very hard to find the right partners, but if you do it and you think about it properly, it works really, really well for you. And finally, in making that work, you have to create that team of us. So when you think about your team, you're thinking about your strategic partner as well as you're thinking about your employees. And, and very important to do that. And lastly, the last one I think is, what's really important is the communication. So one of the things I've spent a lot of time in terms of being present around this program is communicating with staff individually, at town halls, at, 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 on a location basis. And the, the, the messaging we focused on is, is really about helping both the project teams, but also helping your individuals understand, obviously this slide formatted really well, right? You know, right? 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 So, so we're still working on the communication strategy, right? right? So what, we're, what we did was we said, in everything we do, there's four questions. There's only four questions. What, why, how, and what are the outcomes? Doesn't matter what you're doing, doesn't matter in an employee coming to work every day, why am I here, what am I doing, what's the outcome for me? So keep your communication simple, 
but focus it around answering four questions. And don't be afraid to be, to be looking at, you know, answer, like we were very honest and very open with our employees in terms of what we're doing. What is the Becoming a Torah program about? Well, what it's about is it's changing the organization. And we were very open in talking about, you know, well, what does that mean? Well, it means, you know, we're trying to build sustainability. We're trying to tackle inefficiency. So we weren't afraid in being honest and open about what we did. And finally, what we did, and this to me was one of the best slides I think we've ever put together in the last two years. We defined what the Becoming a Torah program would mean for each individual. So what was the out, how would the outcome affect you? And we said, look, it will, you know, it will take you away from doing the drudgery, the stuff that kills you today, the stuff that's really difficult to do, moving you into an environment that's more collaborative, environment that we value your expertise and use your expertise. But in doing this, we created an environment that people understood what the outcome of this was. And we spent a lot of time then saying, I'm telling you this, now please play it back to me. Do you understand? Does it make sense? And I think that's really important. So finally, to sum up, right, what am I, what am I, we'll talk, Rebecca, about formatting, right? Explio, brilliant at QA, right? We need to work on the graphic design, right? <laughs> okay, so, so to sum up, I think there's, there's four things I would say to you to take away today, right? As a leader in trying to retain staff, you need to know what your value proposition is. Why do people want to work for you? Why do people want to work with you? Now is really important that you actually develop a strategic plan because talented people have options. If you're not focused on their needs, someone else will be. And if you don't retain the people, you'll fail to deliver your change agenda. Three teams, so we talked about the three teams, develop strategic partnerships, implement hy hybrid working, and create that partnership as a team of us. And finally, and I leave you with this, is delivering a human-centric, flexible work experience will help you retain, empower, and attract staff, ensuring increased productivity, employee engagement, and most of all, you keep your job because you deliver. Thank you very much.